So einen schönen Nachmittag. Heute wieder Philosophie am Sonntag. Für die deutschen Teilnehmer. So, einen Moment. Für die deutschen Teilnehmer, das ist ein Event auf Englisch. Und ähm, die, in Zukunft werde ich diesen Stream auch äh, im englischen Channel äh, streamen. Und ihr könnt natürlich trotzdem deutsche Fragen stellen. Ansonsten würde ich so... Hallo! Genau. Äh, ansonsten würde ich jetzt auf Englisch weitermachen und die Leute begrüßen. So, hello! So, uh, we're just waiting a little bit and I'm explaining uh, how the stream will go. If you have any question, just uh, type it in the chat or just uh, interrupt me um, because I tend to... Yeah, it's going to be uh, English. I just wanted to have a, a quick German introduction because I'm still managing different, different channels. Uh, also, this... Um, is currently live streamed on YouTube. So you, if you don't want to, let's say, participate in uh, with Zoom or you have some problems with Zoom, you can just uh, join the uh, the chat in, in YouTube. That being said, uh, I'm just checking. So I think people can hear me and we can Okay, and people coming in. So, hello. So, and hello, Malik. Okay. Uh, so, some of you, so, hello. Uh, yeah, so you, I mean, it's it's up to you if you want to switch on video or not. Um, I think it's more engaging if you do, but it's up to you. The only thing is, if you don't have a question or uh, have, have nothing to say, just switch off your mic and switch it on whenever you want to say or ask something. Um, you can always interrupt me. I'm usually uh, speaking a lot, so uh, just... Uh, Put something in the chat or uh, just interrupt me. Okay, so uh, I think uh, from last time no one was here, so I will just summarize uh, what happened in the first meetup. Uh, so the so the whole uh, people coming. Uh, so the the whole idea of this um, meetup is to discuss what is what is the self, what is uh, consciousness. Um, to, to get there, we have to go through a number of steps. I always try to summarize the, the, entire, uh, the entire course, uh, but usually we, we need a number of steps. And last time we discussed uh, evolution and you kind of have to have a knowledge about evolution to understand how the how the brain works because you have to know where where did it come from and to understand individual brain parts you have to know that each brain part uh, had a had a specific role in our evolution so it's not like that there was the that great designer and put like specific brain parts in specific positions so there's no overall design although it looks like as it is uh, if it is designed so um, that, that that was the challenge so um, if you have a solid understanding of evolution I think you you're fine uh, last time I also introduced the evolution of attention um, we will uh, cover this uh, today as well um, and uh, we will start with a quick video just to just to get you started uh, just have to move. Okay, no. uh, I did a little bit of an animation maybe you have already seen it but uh, just as a as a little start we just move over Zip. 
and we'll I'll, I'll discuss it uh, afterwards. One moment, something happened. <laughs> um, okay, I see. I see. There we go. Okay, just sorry. And back a little bit, and we'll continue. <laughs> Okay, uh, do you have any questions already about this? Otherwise, I just walk you through that and then we continue more in depth in that topic. Uh, let me give it a look. Yes, over here. I'll just check the chat. Okay. So, uh, or any comments about it? Uh, one comment I got is that it's too fast. I will will work on that. It's a little bit too much information in a small space. Um, so again, just just interrupt me if you if, if you have anything. Um, so the um, here here again the uh, the, the overview. Uh, the first two we already I already did. I can quickly go over that. The basic idea here was um, for, for the basics of evolution to explain, okay, what's a genotype, what's a phenotype, etc. What is selection? What is a mutation, etc. You can, if, if you have any questions when it comes up, uh, just, just ask me. And the other one was the history of evolutionary thought. Uh, that was uh, how people like Charles Darwin um, um, developed the theory at all. I mean, he, he, he didn't like fall from the sky and, and, and here he is the, here's the theory, but uh, a lot of people uh, came before him. Uh, just a quick look 
here at the list. So uh, a lot of people from from Thales, uh, 600 BC uh, up to uh, up to the Middle Ages, up to the Renaissance, people had different thoughts about uh, where humans came from, how uh, animals adapted to the environment, and everyone had like a like a tiny piece and uh, the big. Uh, um, accomplishment of Darwin was basically to put it all together uh, as well as to um, gather all the experimental data. I mean, he, he traveled around the world. And, um, and this this step-by-step uh, -step development of a theory we also find in the brain. Um, the brain, you, you cannot like look at a brain part and say, okay, nature then took one million years to develop uh, the neocortex or something like that. There always has to be a specific reason, a specific environmental challenge uh, that that brain part had to overcome. And as you saw in the animation, uh, basically um, the, the little, little animal robot uh, always had a, had a little challenge in, in uh, its environment and developed a certain certain part of the brain to overcome it. And that is, I just switch over here. And that is basically um, an overview. I just make it big. So. Um, and the 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 human brain or the, the animal brain underwent those challenges as, as, uh, as well. Um, the first uh, animals that were, were actually sponges had uh, calcium signaling, I will discuss it uh, briefly, uh, then, then a basic nerve net, then the information was being classified, then we had the first types of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a sensory apparatus with the olfactory system, the sense of smell, and then uh, evolution started with the whole a classification of visual signals and the uh, uh, question how to decide what to do. And that is basically uh, the, the thalamus, basa ganglia, amygdala and hippocampus. And again, each, each single part contributed a little bit to what we call today our brain. And if we go one more here with uh, there's, there's more, of course, uh, sharks with the cerebellum uh, and the mammals with the neocortex and finally the primates, I mean, with the focus, I mean, other, other animals do have also a prefrontal cortex, uh, but in primates it's especially large. Uh, they also have had to overcome a specific challenge in the environment. And that is... Um, and that is the important uh, takeaway. <clears throat> um, that is that is the important takeaway. Uh, so okay, that is that is the important takeaway. Um, you can never have a part of the brain that had didn't overcome a specific challenge in the environment. And this way, if we look back, for example, if we examine how um, how our cousins, how our apes, uh, the ape cousins. Uh, lift, we can actually learn about the functions of the brain. Um, this will be one focus. Um, of course, this um, tree is uh, much larger, of course, with many, many other animals. Those are just basically examples, uh, but, but with the specific most important points in the evolution of the brain. And um, here, uh, I mean, you don't see much about, uh, let's say, um, visual processing or everything about the neocortex. This will be in the in the second part today. We, we have to see how far we come. And um, the, the focus will really be the, the, the central part of the brain. Uh, some call it reptilian brain. Uh, I just wait. I have a have a guy here who lends who who didn't like the last stream. No. Um, and if you look, I mean that is the that is the the, the the 
neocortex we usually know, but but that is just uh, a part, and we basically first talk about everything but the neocortex. And we okay, I think I lost the ah there it is. And what we'll talk about first is this part, and that is in the very no, very center of the brain, and it goes like that. Oh, so. so, so, and it goes like uh, this, this way. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, I should actually make that a little bit bigger. So. And all these all these parts up to the neocortex or almost and in cerebellum. I mean, uh, on the uh, first page. Uh, that's basically everything here. So uh, information classification, olfactory system. Well, that's that is in another part, but we can say okay, that's a that's a basic function. Optic tectum is also uh, I think. Uh, not not directly here, but thalamus, basal ganglia, amygdala, hippocampus. Uh, that's all part here in the, in the very center of the brain, and that uh, is so fundamental. If there is any damage to to the to the very very inner part of your brain, then it's usually some sort of, of coma because you can't really process any information uh, anymore. Uh, of course, it, it depends if it's for example the the the, the, the hippocampus then it's more related to uh, memory or amygdala for the information evaluation we will come to come to that in detail so but but that is that is really like like very a uh, crucial part and it's in the very center of the brain and very well protected and of course very well connected and all that i mean that what we call what we usually refer to as the brain is uh, just just some some additional functions uh, that aren't that important, at least not to our direct survival. So you can do pretty well with, with just that. I mean, finding, finding food and, and, and surviving, that, that should, be, should be possible. Okay, um, let's uh, take a look at, at the sponges. So I'll switch to small. So what did they do? Uh, so these are these are is a picture of sponges. So they are actually not not plants but animals. Uh, they are fixed uh, fixed on the ground, but they're still animals uh, animal cells, and they have uh, one type of movement. Uh, they can if there's uh, like toxins or, or some other uh, stuff inside there. Uh, the, the the tubes here can just uh, spit it out. I mean, they can contract their, um, their their muscles and spit out all the all the uh, toxic water, and and that's it. And uh, they don't have a nerve net. They don't have a brain. They can't think. Okay, now it's now it's a lot lot of lot of uh, uh, waste uh, inside the tube. Now I do something. Instead, uh, they ha they don't even have uh, like nerves in that regard. They have calcium signaling. And you can imagine calcium signaling like having a room full buckets full of water and you fill uh, one of those buckets uh, with more water and it overflows, overflows to the next one, overflows to the next one, overflows to the next one. And this way you have like a like a stream of information. And in the, uh, in the, in the uh, case of the sponges, I mean, it's it's individual cells they have uh, like a calcium storage and they can release individual cells can release that calcium storage to um, cells nearby and activate those cells to also release their calcium storage to cells nearby and then you have a, like a like a chain reaction and that is uh, i mean that is one basic form of uh, uh, controlling different cells in uh, computer science. This is also called, uh, or this is also used, uh, uh, called cellular automata. So you don't have um, an, 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 
uh, overarching uh, control that controls everything, but you have individual cells making individual decisions, and those individual decisions uh, result in a global action. And of course, the um, sponges can only do one thing, contract and push out the water, that's all. Um, we're spending a lot of time on that because that is really a very fundamental part, um, the question of who controls actually the, the, the movement. I mean, and, and you wouldn't say, okay, do they have a sense of self if they, if, 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 an, if a cell is activated and, and then uh, calcium signaling is going on? Probably not. The question is, if you go further down the chain of, of, of animals, down to, down to apes, down to humans, at what point do we say, ah, okay, here is now, here, here we introduce now consciousness. So uh, this is one way of finding out, okay, where, where, what is it? Where, where do we put the, put the limits? Uh, and, 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 and finding out, okay, where, where exactly is it? Okay, any questions for this one? And no problem to interrupt me, especially on the YouTube chat, uh, because it's a little bit with a time lag, just I'll write the question. Okay, let's, now let's look at this guy. Uh, it looks a little bit more uh, <laughs> more exciting here. Uh, that's, the, that's the Hydra. Uh, the Hydra has tentacles. And with the tentacles, if like a small uh, an, uh, water creature comes by, like a, like a Daphnia, like you might have seen those, those little ones under the microscope or some, some, uh, at some point, um, maybe in school or, or privately, um, once, once uh, they, they touch the tentacle, then the tentacles uh, grab, the, uh, grab the animal and, well, then eat it. So, uh, and the uh, Hydra has, it doesn't have uh, calcium signaling anymore, but actually has nerves, but a nerve net. So there's no central brain deciding what to do. Instead, if there is any signal coming in, on the on the uh, on the tentacles. I mean, if it uh, surpasses a certain uh, threshold, then uh, the tentacles contract and grab the grab the animal. Um, so you can basically say, okay, it's a one-to-one -one, um, uh, connection. So any signal leads to the one possible actions action, meaning contracting the um, the tentacle. So if if we were like Hydras, like if someone touches you, uh, you would, would suddenly fall to the ground and all your muscles would, would spasm and, and everything would be activated. So that would be like a Hydra nerve, uh, nerve net. And we can also say, okay, that's probably not consciousness. <laughs> or maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I mean, one, one thing, one, one question here is often, okay, um, the, the, the meeting is called uh, evolution of attention. Um, what is attention? I mean, what, uh, at, at what point can we say, okay, this animal focuses on a specific signal? Um, do I have the guy? I do have the guy. Yeah. So if you look at this guy, I already had it uh, last time. Uh, we personally, we humans put a lot of weight into into the uh, regarding the eyes. So uh, and, and the eyes are basically uh, uh, sense organs that are about uh, attention. I mean, you you select a certain part of the room or uh, or of the screen and say, okay, I'm focusing now on that part. So you basically filtering out everything else and you're focusing on that that singular part and you're looking at it and and the eyes are of course as as some people call it like windows to the soul because that is basically an um, uh, evident or, or shows you what is the person currently focusing on and we strongly connect it with what is the person currently uh, thinking about even i mean what is in their what is in their brain going on and the question is, what is going on in the Hydra? Well, 
the Hydra focuses also, I mean, the Hydra doesn't have, have eyes, but the Hydra also focuses on, um, well, the, 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 the signal coming in from the, from the tentacle. So let's, uh, if, again, any questions or comments? Otherwise, we move on uh, to the to the dog. Um, I mean, we we talked about a single single signal coming in. Uh, it was 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 my yeah well was my tentacle touched or not? That was the was the, was the question about the hydra. Now we introduce we we expand on these these nerve nets because you can configure the nerve nets in a way to do actual information processing. And one way of information processing is the XOR filter. You basically say um, if there is a if you have two inputs and you have a signal on the on the on the one sens sensory organ and on the other sensory organ um, then you can do four different things basically uh, so in the case of the uh, dog i mean you're looking at uh, two different situations the dog at 1 pm and the dog at 2 pm and where is the dog sitting or, or lying around and then you have of course four different situations and based on that information you can make additional uh, you can analyze that information and make additional statements about your environment Meaning, uh, if the dog was in the basket and is still in the basket, apparently the dog has not moved. I mean, whether or not the dog has moved, you don't have that basic information if you just have two, two pictures. You have to analyze those two pictures. Has the dog moved, yes or no? And of course, if the dog was uh, in the basket and is now uh, in the, on, on the rug, the dog has moved. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit silly uh, example, but um, I mean, it is relevant for our visual system. So if you, if you see something, uh, you blink and see a second picture and blink again, you have two pictures and your brain can use those two pictures to decide has something moved. And of course, if you're, if you're an animal looking for prey or vice versa, if you want to Want to move away from predators it's hugely important to have that classification of signals to see okay where was movement and this analysis of where the movement was you can simply do by a simple nerve net and and have basically uh, i think two or three neurons i think you need three neurons to build that uh, xor filter so that is a very basic thing and it doesn't require like a huge brain that uh, where you where, that thinks about, okay, what, what has happened? It's simply a, a comparison of two pictures and what has changed. And uh, we see that if you look at, for example, here at this palm tree, um, uh, the XOR filter would simply be okay if it's a static image, what has changed compared to the environment? And the right uh, image is basically what has changed if you if you look if you go over the the picture and the change was of course uh, when you look at the contour of the picture and that is basically the important part uh, because you might not want to have all the details uh, like like in between what colors it is you might just want to have like the basic contour is it a tree or is it a tiger in front of me and that basic information might be already enough to decide whether to approach it or whether to run away from it. So, and again, no, no like special brain or something is needed. It's just a connection of the different sense data of the different sense organs to decide, okay, has something changed or not? And for our visual system, it's of course, uh, you can connect this information now with uh, the the eye movements. If you already have like evolved eyes, uh, you can say, okay, move your eyes towards uh, something that has changed, and that is basically what uh, was in the in the short clip uh, in the, in the beginning um, with the optic tectum. You have a way of uh, moving your eyes towards a moving target, 
and then maybe with some additional um, processing you also include uh, muscle movements and move towards that target and uh, this this guy is then the next on the on the evolutionary tree that's uh, a, a lancelet it is like a very primitive fish uh, it doesn't have lungs uh, i think uh, it doesn't have a uh, uh, heart either uh, so a lot is um, done uh, like with, with uh, those gill slits uh, to uh to get the, the to get the oxygen into the into the body and there is a nerve nerve cord and there are also um sense organs along alongside of the of the animal and that sense organ is basically a nose i mean it's a chemical detector it's an uh, olfactory system and the lancelet moves around in the water and if there are some nutrients if, if that sense organ alongside the, its body detects some nutrients it um, sends a signal to the muscles to move towards that direction uh, i mean whether it's whether you have like two noses left and right on your body and and you move towards uh, the the uh, nutrient source or whether you have two eyes and you you move your body and move towards the uh, source it's basically the same um, of course it's a simplification but basically it is an animal with two noses and with that it can direct uh, uh, its its movement is it a fossil um i think there are some still alive i have to look it up mm. this i think uh, I mean, it's not a direct predecessor of, uh, well, it could be seen, but I think it's, they're still, they're still alive. Yeah. There's still, uh, ancestors of it. I think they're also very small. I can, I can look it up and we can then discuss it in the, uh, the end. Okay. When, when you say primitive fish, I thought that it's, yeah, it's not alive anymore. Um, well, uh, okay, they, they still, they still exist, um, they are, how large are they, and, oh, okay, they are also commercially harvested as food in, in Asia, so, um, they are, uh, they are still alive, even with that simple, simple layout of their body. So apparently, they still have a have a niche niche in that regard. Um, I mean, it has all the all the parts it needs. I mean, I, I mean, there's no like push uh, in in nature to say, okay, all all animals have to develop brains or all animals have to develop lungs because they're the best. As long as they have their niche and it works for them, why not? Um, so they are uh, since uh, I think 500 million years. 500 million years. Wow. Yeah. So that is the. I mean, they even um, they're even older than the uh, than fish. I mean, it, it already looks a little bit like fish, but I mean, you don't see any any eyes. You don't see uh, like the lungs or something like that. It's really uh, a very primitive one, but that's why it's a great thing to to examine um, and and to learn from. So again, you don't need. I mean, if you look at modern animals, you th you think, okay, if you if you would sit down and have to design an animal, okay, let's let's put in a heart, let's put in a lung, let's put in eyes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but you don't really need that. I mean, you you, you can do with, with with less. And I mean, evolutionary speaking, it was always the case that all organs were basically optional. It's just an uh, addition uh, to have that. Uh, so a nerve cord is an addition. I mean, it has some advantages, but you don't really need it, as as we've seen with the with the sponges. You don't really need that. 
I mean, it's it's great to have it, but you can still be well and alive in 2021 without a half god. <laughs> so um, that is that is the one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's uh, great articles on on Wikipedia, and I think even is there a video. How the organism decides if ah. it needs something or not? Like, um, I mean, obviously there's no brain. Um, there is the question is of course does the uh, does the organism has like uh, a way of regulating hunger or if it is automatically always moving towards the food source. I mean, um, uh, does it evolve? So the the um, um, the olfactory system, or basically, I mean, the the, the nose is alongside the uh, the fins and uh, alongside the body. So it has a lot of information. Where is the next food source? So uh, maybe it is just an automatic decision. Okay, move always mm -hmm. towards a food source. Um, there is a project. Uh, I think it's called Open Warm or something like that where they um, actually can, an even more primitive organism than that, uh, simulate it completely. I mean, with, with everything that, that entails it. And they actually run the organism on the computer. Okay, bye, thank you. Clemens. Yeah, mm -hmm. come again. I said thank you. Yeah, also, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I can wait. I'll just note it down. Uh, I think it's called Open Warm. It's a little bit, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> Very. Uh, there's also, um, I can do one on that, a separate meetup. Um, uh, the whole idea of digit digital organisms. I mean, uh, if they're not, if they're not living like in, in the sea, but in a like digital space and what uh, components do they need? Uh, that's also an interesting part. I mean, that's all the, the whole subject of artificial life. Yeah, it's also very digital organism is really interesting idea. I mean, uh, we have it. We have it on Facebook, <laughs> basically, and it's called Memes. Uh, I mean, if it's a funny picture, you share it, and basically the the picture. Uh, uh, capture or, or, or hacks your brain and t tells you to to click share. <laughs> I mean, in a way, it's it's more like a like a virus or mm. something like that. If it's a or if it's a sensational headline, you're you're inclined to share it. And the more people share it, the, the more it distributes. And um, the, that could also be something like a digital organism. Uh, but there, but there are true digital organisms that uh, you can put into uh, into a memory bank of the computer, and all that animal, the digital animal, does is make a copy of yourself, make a copy of yourself, make a copy of yourself. And when you introduce like basic mutations, like little changes in the in the program, after a while it might be quicker to do that and and do it more efficiently and do more efficient copies of itself and in copies 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 and the more efficient copy will then eventually push out the less efficient copy and then fill up the the memory and then maybe uh, an even more efficient uh, uh, program comes in and through a mutation and overtakes the um uh, overtakes uh, the memory but um I mean, that's, that's super exciting. I can post a few links, um, especially a 20-minute video about it. Uh, it's, it's super, super interesting. It's a little bit off topic, though. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we will, um, let's keep that for, for another time. Okay. Uh, and that's just the landslide, and we don't even, we're, we're not even at the apes and it's already it's already getting complicated how, how things work <laughs> so uh no ah oh yeah okay it's just a uh, just a description i mean um 
Uh, so the lens that has a, a basic uh, basic uh, sense of uh, of smell basically and to to uh, move towards the uh, nutrient source. But the other thing we'll we'll talk talk later when we're at the at the apes. Uh, well, that's just uh, that that's also something we can talk about later. Um, and I already said uh, the optic tectum, the the eyes, and and how important. Uh, they are and that is one organ that developed in fish simply to move towards uh, towards the target and oh uh, can you mute yourself just so yeah perfect okay um and that is basically the overview in the brain and so we have again this guy here, here the the eyes of course, and the um, visual nerve comes out here in these two small holes. And the first thing here, as you see here, they uh, connect of course the left and and right eye, um, and to distribute the image to the left and right uh, hemisphere. The idea is to have uh, processing of the left visual um, uh, field on the wait on the on the on the left side and the right visual field on the on the right side and for that the information has to cross over here in the, the uh, optic uh, chasm to have basically um, two sources of information and to produce a three-dimensional image um, but the, the, the part we're talking about is the uh, optic tectum or also called uh, superior colliculus. I mean, it's depending on which animal you look at, but it's, it's basically the same. And that is here the, the blue, blue dot. And that is basically um, eye movements, tracking. If you, if you see something moving, uh, that helps you directly to track it. You don't have to consciously think about it. Okay, now I am tracking the the thing, but you'd simply go over with your with your eyes. I mean, it's it's a subconscious thing, especially if it's something that suddenly comes into view. Uh, your eyes go directly to the to the thing without even asking your, your asking your consciousness uh, whether whether it should be doing that or not. There are some, that's a little bit more complicated, we will we'll come to that later, but the basic point is uh, just with that little organ, uh, the whole tracking is done. Uh, and not the tracking uh, where, where you say, okay, I consciously look at, at this and move, but uh, simply if something moves along inside your, your visual field, that's uh, where the uh, optic tectum or superior colliculus uh, gets activated. Okay. Um, the challenge is now uh, we are getting a lot of information from the eyes, maybe from the olfactory system, maybe we also had some ears, and all that information comes in. And the question, as, as you asked before, uh, okay, now how do we decide and, and what, to, what to do with all that information? And the first step is to pre process the um, information. Uh, for example, our eyes have different color cones, uh, red, green, and uh, blue, basically. Uh, but we are, uh, when, when we're looking at something, we don't see like a, a, a picture of, of, of pixels or of cones with little dots or so. We see more a smooth image with certain colors. And that happens in the, in the telomus. It integrates different uh, information and relays it, relates, relays it into uh, other brain parts. And it also calculates like a first three-dimensional image uh, coming in from the, from the eyes to, for example, activate a, a reflex. Uh, and if, if you look again here, the telomus, that's here, the yellow, uh, well, let's see the, the red and green little dots in the middle. Um, they, they are relatively near the eye, so they are ones that do the initial processing. And if something 
uh, flies towards you, uh, that part is already processing, okay, is that something dangerous or not? So it doesn't go through the, through the whole brain and you, you think about it and you elaborate, should I move my head or shouldn't I move my head? Uh, instead here, uh, it's a more like, it, it's not a real reflex action, but no conscious thought is here uh, uh, implied. So there's no, um, no thinking implied here. It's just pre-processing of the image of your three dimensional image. And maybe uh, a first evaluation, okay, do I have to track the object with my eyes to see it better? Or do I have to maybe quickly move my, move my head away? And that is all done without, without this part. Okay. Um, yeah, what I already said, okay, there's a lot of information coming in. Uh, the question is, what do you do if you see something moving like uh, on the, on the, from the right and something on the left, and then you hear something here and you hear something in your back? and you smell something and someone touches you what do you do i mean there are a lot of lot of different options you can do you, you can do um but you have to decide for one action you can't move back and forth at the same time run away from that and from that and move move to the left and to the right you have to decide for one action and uh, to uh, regulate that uh, to arbitrate that conflict basically between the different parts of the brain because we are we're adding now a lot of additional brain parts we need some sort of arbiter to say okay that's that's what we're doing and that's what we're not doing and you could say well there's just the basal ganglia there's like a little person inside the basal ganglia and it looks at everything and then makes the decision but of course uh, it there's no like uh, decision maker in the in the basal ganglia. It's what it basically does. It looks at the uh, signal strength of different um, input uh, of different sensory inputs, and then simply says, okay, that is the strongest signal. Uh, we will do that, uh, but I will suppress every other signal. So that is basically decision making, uh, deciding for the strongest. Uh, strongest decision. It's like if you're in a uh, group or so and uh, you do a little poll to decide, okay, what wh where should we go uh, in the evening? What what should we eat? And nine people say, okay, we go, uh, uh, we, we eat Italian food. And one person says, okay, uh, let's eat uh, Spanish or f French food. So, and you can't like have both decisions. I mean, you can't eat or order, order both at the same time. I mean, of course you could at the twice the price, but at the end you can only uh, visit one restaurant. I mean, it's different now, but let's say uh, before 2020, you visit one, you, you can only visit one restaurant and not two different ones. You have to make a decision. And this decision-making, uh, uh, this, this arbitrating of this decision-making is done with the basic ganglia. So if you have, have a very strong signal coming from the right and a very weak signal, uh, like you hear something on, on the left, then you might decide, okay, I uh, focus my attention on the strongest signal. And that is, of course, something uh, that helps with the survival. I mean, otherwise you have two signals and the animal will, sh will just stand because it can't decide what to do. And then it's captured by two predators at the same time instead of running away. I mean, it's a very, I mean, it's, it's obvious for us because we have, we have all the brain, but for the animal that doesn't have any, any of the brain, it's not clear what to do if there are two, two different signals. And uh, it needs some sort of uh, brain part that suppresses um, weaker signals and decides basically, okay, we do that one one action and that is that is the basic ganglia and that is a very very important part of the brain we will come back uh, later because you already might might notice okay this is uh, there there's some decider but as i as i explained there's no little person inside okay that thinks uh, okay what should we do i mean it's basically just uh, executing certain rules 
uh, to say, okay, um, uh, we just execute the strongest signal. That is, that is, that is, that's why I call it also a referee or arbiter. Uh, it's not or rules, but it's not like a, a CEO or something like that that makes decisions, but simply follows certain rules and decides for a strong signal. Um, the question is, of course, uh, the strongest signal is not always the best. Uh, and it would be good to have um, additional, additional properties in our brain. Um, maybe uh, the weak signal is the, is the critical one. I mean, uh, a tiger approaching us in the, in the grass, I mean, very, very carefully moves very slowly with little, little noise. But maybe that little signal is maybe the most important signal we need to focus on. And that is uh, then the task basically of the amygdala to say, okay, we don't have just strong and weak signals. We can also uh, add some sort of, sort of evaluation to the signal. So uh, maybe um, the, 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 the weak tiger signal should be very strong before it reaches the, the basal ganglia. And that is the part of the amygdala to say, okay, I will analyze the sense data and say, okay, this is important and this is not important. And this is also why uh, it is said that the amygdala is uh, uh, basically uh, responsible for emotions because emotions are very much connected to um, evaluation. I mean, if you like something or dislike something, that is, that is the amygdala. Um, and you don't like go out into the world and do things just because there's the strongest signal to do something. You have uh, an evaluation going on. And uh, amygdala is also very central. We will revisit several times. It is connected with the, with the hypothalamus to uh, evaluate memories and it has a learning function that is uh, that, that comes also in, into play again and uh, it also provides some sort of memory in the hormonal system so if you see a tiger uh, or if you see something uh, that changes quickly you might go into a fight flight freeze or fawn response i mean uh, you run away you freeze so that you don't so that the predator doesn't see you or you try to negotiate. I mean, that's a more more advanced response um, or you just try to run away. Um, challenges, of course, I mean, for us, it's obvious we see a tiger and we run away for the animal. It sees a tiger, turns around, the tiger is no longer there. And then it says, OK, tiger is gone. Uh, I, I don't need to worry anymore. And I mean, the, the, the animal at this point of, the, of, of evolution doesn't have like an idea, okay, that the tiger is still there. Uh, we see that, for example, in, in small children, then they do um, uh, hide, and, hide and seek or uh, peekaboo game uh, where, they, where they hide. And they, children still have to learn to um, remember that things are still there despite uh, they no longer see it. And for, for a simple animal, if something moves behind a tree, it's gone. It's, they no longer, uh, they, they, they ignore it, that, that there was something. And uh, the amygdala with the homo hormonal system at least provides a basic memory system. I mean, you're still, after, after seeing the tiger, you're still in fear or you still want to fight the tiger. I mean, you're still um, in stress or distress uh, and you, you want to run away from the situation or approach the situation, even though you no longer see the tiger. So you no longer know, okay, why do we have uh, the feeling, but you know you still have the feeling. And of course, the hormones take a, take a while to, to degrade in the in the body, so that is why it's a basic memory system that maybe uh, it takes an hour or half an hour for the for the adrenaline re to to reside again. 
and you're you're no longer in that fight flight freeze or fawn response so um, again this is this is pro probably the most complex one to to understand and the most critical one and we will come back to that again later again and again because like the like the basal ganglia it is a very central part of the brain and very crucial part of the brain and we will also learn later what happens if that part of the brain is is damaged or uh, if, if there are other connection problems with the amygdala questions Oh, I have to look at the chat. Clemens, yep. um, I got a question about consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, that it was the subject of tonight, today's talk. How it, it came to being, like um, how brain starts recognizing itself. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, uh, we, we will come to that. Uh, it is a, I mean, the, how I planned it, it's a 10 part, uh, 10 part course, um, but I can give you a short outlook, uh, what, what is to come in that regard. So we will, we will finish up the, 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 the basic parts of the, uh, of, of the brain and how, how that works. Uh, but as you might have noticed, I mean, that's, uh, basic basic reactions like remembering running away approaching maybe eating or thinking that food is good or food is bad all those very basic basic behaviors uh, once you have completed that we will move on to the to the to the neocortex and all the neocortex basically does is suppress that basic system so uh, without the neocortex if you see food you approach it and eat it that's that, that's all all you can do with the with the neocortex you can say oh wait a minute wait a minute uh i know there's there's it might be poisoned or i know uh i have to save up the food for tomorrow or i know that food belongs to someone and i can't take it so basically the, the basic function of the um of the neocortex i mean especially of the frontal lobe is to suppress what is go su suppress what is going on in the rest of the brain. So, um, and the, the, the frontal lobe, because it is not connected directly to, to, a, to, a, to a sense organ or something like that, it is basically uh, looking into the brain. Um, and, and, and suppressing what is going on there. But, but this suppression goes on by models. Uh, for example, it has a model, it has a social model. Who belongs, who, who, uh, who belongs that food? Or what is my relationship with that person? Or where did I store my food? And for all that, you, le you need like a, a mental map. Where did I put the food uh, or how, how is my relationship with that person? And you need some sort of simulator. What will happen tomorrow? So you have to be able to create a model of, of yourself tomorrow. And you also have to have a model of uh, your body because uh, if it's just trial and error, I mean, if you if you grab a glass, then you might miss the glass and you have to visually adjust. Okay, where is the glass? But if you have like a, an intuitive model of your body, then you know uh, you don't have to think about each individual muscle in your body. You just say or you just think or decide, okay, I, I grab the glass. And not just do you have a model of your body, you also have a model of what will you think next? Or what will other people think about you? I mean, it's a, a next uh, meta model. So if you're in a conversation, of course, it would be ideal if you already know how that person will react to what you're, you're saying. So you have like a basic model. Okay, that person likes pizza or that person uh, or I still owe that person something. So I have to I have to give them something uh, or that person is, is in pain. Uh, I know that because we talked yesterday, so I will ask that person. So you have a model of other people 
how they will react and you have a model of your body how how your body reacts if you do something and you also have a model of your own brain to decide what uh, to, to know how you will react in a certain situation so for example you could imagine if you have a talk uh, next next week and you imagine yourself uh, in front of the in front of the audience and you think about okay how will re i react in that situation so for that you need a model of yourself and you can build the model uh, of yourself by experience uh, by making making it by also by challenging yourself to see okay what what can you do or what can't you do so basically a uh, building self-confidence or building self-consciousness uh, by uh, finding out okay what can you do and what can't you do so you have basically a description of yourself uh, that says okay um, that is that is me and that is that is something i will will do in the future and that is not i mean as i've explained it's not just something yeah well it's a nice thing to have to to, to think about it uh, you have obvious evolutionary advantages if you can think in advance how will i react in that situation or can i can i can i i don't know can i fight that person or can i can i challenge that person um or can i can i can i win that game or can i make that speech or can i jump from the uh, or, or jump on that on, on, on that ledge um with, with knowing or being able to imagine what will happen helps you tremendously because you basically have a way of looking into the future. You don't have to experience it first before, uh, uh, before knowing what will happen. Um, this uh, is not yet, uh, I mean, it's a, for, for consciousness, you need a little bit more um, because you need, you need some sort of feedback and, and and think about it but but that is the, the that is the core core element we will come to uh you need to have a model of yourself and if i ask you okay what do you do you don't start analyzing your your neurons on a, on a molecular level and, and 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 explain to me how how your brain works instead you're accessing that model the model you built your whole life about yourself who you are uh, what you're good at, what you're not good at, or what you think you're good at and think you're not good at, and you tell me that. You never tell me like the real you. The, I mean, I only basically meet the real you in the actual situation. But by life experience, you build up a model of yourself. Okay, I'm probably this person in, in that situation. I mean, uh, people then, I don't know, brag, okay, I'm, yeah, no problem, I will, I will do that. But if they're actually in the situation, maybe they, they still fail. So there's a difference between who they are and what they think they are. So uh, that is a very, very, very uh, <laughs> brief, brief overview. Uh, what we will, can I quickly? Uh, well, let's let's do a quick uh, which, which quick preview. Uh, just move to the last slide. View uh, present. So that's one of the last slides. <clears throat> so if you if you really um, map it out how the brain works or how consciousness works, uh, you uh, wait. Uh, maybe maybe first the model. That's uh, the question is. Ah, yeah, okay. Maybe this. So uh, wait. Uh, to full screen. Uh, okay. No, no. So the so the basic part is uh, the object permanence, meaning what is where in the environment. So if the tiger hides behind the tree, then you still have a model of the world. Okay, I know there's a tiger, and the tiger just moved behind the tree. So the tr 
the, the tiger is still mentally there and you can still think about the tiger. The next model is the body schema. So what happens if I move my, my arm? Can I reach something? Or do I fit through, um, through an opening? Do I fit through this door? Uh, or uh, uh, what movement do I have to do to scratch my, scratch my shoulder? I don't think about uh, the 20 or 50 muscles in my, my arm, uh, but I just think about, okay, I scratch my shoulder. I use that simplified model to translate what is, what is going on. Then the theory of mind I mentioned, okay, what, uh, what do other people think? Uh, so I can predict how they will react. Then the um, attention schema is, okay, what am I currently thinking about uh, and who am I? What, is, what do I currently uh, focus on? And the awareness she schema is basically manipulating your own focus. Uh, thinking about the future, thinking step by step in the, in, into the future, imagining different, uh, different situations. So these are, these are the models created. But these are, these, these models, it's, it's all in the, uh, in, the, in the neocortex. So without those models, you, uh, if the tiger hides behind the tree, you no longer, uh, you ignore that the tiger exists. Without the body schema, you can't uh, um, uh, make those intuitive decisions. Okay, I I uh, grab a certain thing and will 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 grab it. Uh, you can't. You have to do it by trial and error. I mean, you you grab something and then see. Okay, the hand is not not on the on the glass, and you move it a little bit right. You move it a little bit left until you until you have it. And with the body schema, you can move directly your arm to the to the thing because with the model you can um, predict the future how your how your arm will will, will touch it. Uh, same with the theory of mind. You have a theory, okay, what's going on in the other person, and with the attention schema you can think about what am I currently thinking about. It's like that that meta level, and with the awareness schema you can manipulate what you're currently thinking about. But uh, the challenge here is because I, I it's, it's just a quick, uh, quick preview. Um, I, I'm using the word you, and that is a problem. Uh, to really explain how that works, uh, we, we shouldn't use the word you, because that introduces a certain, uh, certain other thing that somehow sits in the brain and and does things that that is a problem um, and and for that we we first need to do some some theory uh, what uh, what people think is there like a separate mind and a separate body is there a connection between the mind and body is there just a mind or just a body or just a brain uh, there are a lot of questions going uh, going there so uh, there's no easy road to understand it you really have to understand uh, uh, the evolution of the brain, how you get there, how what the individual parts do, and you have to understand um, how the signal processing in the brain works. Um, we will we will come to that in in a uh, in a few minutes, and uh, how the the planning part works, how that modeling works here at the front, and then also how uh, thinking works. That is that will that will be the the, the biggest part. So yeah, you, you want you want an easy answer. Okay, what is consciousness? Okay, here it is here here it is. Uh, but it is it is not not simple. But I think it is fully understandable if you go through all the all the individual steps. Uh, another quick one. Um, I um, divided, oh, I think, well, okay, at least two, five. Um, uh, I divided the, the definition of consciousness in different levels. Uh, that, that is also something we will, we will come to. 
Um, it's also okay. Uh, this this level one is that pre-processing we talked about with the, with the thalamus, with the um, pre-processing of the of the color rods, and we also talked about uh, the three-dimensional pre-processing. So that is the basic one. The second one is attention. We talked about with the optic tectum, but also we will uh, see. Uh, the attention also plays a role in the neocortex. So after a signal is processed, we will uh, we will have different ideas in our or different different thought patterns in our brain, and those uh, are competing. And with the basal ganglia, we will select the the strongest signal um, or the one with the highest emotional value. And this is further uh, processed into what, where, and who, and uh, put into uh, so-called working memory so that other parts of the brain can access what you're focusing on. And we will also see how uh, we can uh, adapt that working memory. But as I, as I said, those are all advanced concepts and we have to do the, have to do the groundwork to get there. It's, it, is, uh, it is challenging. Um, but it is it is possible to get there, but we have to do uh, we have to go through the zip all these 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 parts first. <laughs> so uh, the brain is challenging. Uh, maybe as a quick quick break concerning uh, some 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 images. Um, I mean, we already talked. Okay, we already talked about um, how the thalamus does the pre-processing of the of the colors and of the three-dimensional image. But here we see there's also some pre-processing going on concerning the detection of uh, of of shades. As you see, uh, the the brain recognizes okay. There's a uh, probably a three-dimensional um, ball on a chessboard. So, yeah, it's a, nearly a chessboard, and it has a shadow. Uh, and it looks like well, it's it's a evenly um, colored uh, well chessboard. Uh, but the colors of the uh, white um, squares in the shadow are, have the identical color as the black uh, squares outside the shadow. So that is also some pre-processing going on that we don't have like conscious uh, access to except for the actual result. If you didn't have that, then the world would look very strange. Uh, because we would think that shadows are part of the color of the thing that that they that it falls on. So that is uh, that is a little bit mind bending. Uh, another thing that is wait, ah, that is mind literally mind bending. Well, uh, is um, uh, are these two? So on the left, you might see okay those are those those lines are a little bit bent, uh, but in actually those are parallel straight lines. Um, what is happening? The brain tries again to predict something with its with its models with its visual system. It tries to predict the future uh, because um, it takes a while for the for the wait. I'll put my camera on. Uh, it takes a while for the for the um, uh, for the signal to get through the eyes, get get to the brain, and this process there, and to um, to basically fix that. The brain cheats and says, "Hey, I already know what's happening uh, in the future. I just calculate what's probably in the future." And uh, this image on the left looks like we're moving forward. That's just the the automatic evaluation of the of the brain, and if you're moving forward, then the lines have to be bent like that. 
uh, that is a little bit strange, but that is, that is basically the, the prediction of, of the brain. And in this case, uh, it is a clear error of the, of the uh, it's, a, it's a clear prediction error. It's a, it's a mistake by the brain to assume that we are moving forward because we don't, we're not moving forward. We're just looking at the, at the image. And another one before we go into the details. Okay. No, where is it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Here we see this this uh, upside down head of a, of a woman. It looks normal. Nothing nothing special about it. Everything is there. But if you look a little bit at it and we'll turn it around well uh, point is we have specialized parts in the brain that deal with recognizing parts of the face and they are not trained to deal with things that are upside down that they don't care if they're upside down it's an it's an optimization because usually we don't deal with people uh, standing on their head and it's not something important whether the eyes are this way or that way. So uh, we, can, we can be fooled by that. Um, again, there's some pre-processing going on before, before you're, you're conscious about it and it looks normal. There's nothing, nothing. Maybe, maybe if you really look closely, it looks a little bit strange. Otherwise it is, well. <laughs> Also called the Thatcher effect, and um, to understand what is going on and with all those processing and pre-processing, and to differentiate between uh, okay, what we what we are really conscious of and what is still being pre-processed before we see it, we have to look at this uh, at this uh, pre-processing what is going on in the brain and uh, understand how, how what individual pre-processing goes, goes on there because there are also uh, other, other illusions that are more uh, on the emotional level. Uh, there, are, there are also emotional illusions um, that, are, that are simply calculation errors by the brain that result also in strange, strange behavior. And uh, also there are like delusions and where were you? Um, uh, think something about reality, but but it's not not applicable. And there are also um, what else do we have? Uh, uh, auditory illusions, and there are also uh, illusions or, or cognitive defects regarding your attention. That you, uh, for example, see half of your. Uh, visual field uh, you don't see half of your visual field uh, but you're not aware of it that is also a challenge between the the attention and, and the awareness so we will we will get to that that is just a review so uh, for now we will finish up the evolution of attention and then peek in into the processing that is going on in the brain so quickly get to there so, uh, coming back, we were at the amygdala and from there we had a quick preview of what is going on with consciousness and we are now finishing up here. Um, where is it? Where is the brain? Here is the brain. Uh, the hippocampus. That is... E this part here. This goes all the way around here and what the hippocampus basically does is I mean we had the uh, amygdala that had had a reaction to uh, to sense data and we also have I mean that's that's like sense data and evaluation basically a mapping between those but we also have with the hippocampus a mapping between two experiences actually between two sense data and why do we why do we need to map two sense data with each other well that is basically a form of memory and it is used as a first step 
to find um, uh, or to, to find again places. So if you're navigating, you usually use uh, uh, okay, I know this place that connects to the next place and that connects to the next place. So basically, if you connect two places with, with each other, you can basically build a mental map of your environment. How can I get from 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 A to Z? You go from from this place to that place to that place to that place, and then you you have arrived. And it is of course crucial, uh, evolutionary speaking, to find. Uh, uh, to find again places where you found a lot of uh, nutrients, for example, find uh, berry bushes or where you um, where you borrowed your uh, borrowed the nuts. Where where's your where's your food storage? And to find find your way around or where are dangerous parts of the environment? And that is that is really the part of the uh, hippocampus here. Interestingly, uh, that part directly borders directly borders here if you put that in it yeah oh yeah so that, that, that is the the inside or from it from the other side Oop. um it directly borders here to the uh, temporal lobe and that is the this part here and on the side and if we put everything here together right oh yeah Oop. if we put everything together okay that doesn't fit doesn't matter um we have that brain part here and here's also the ear so there's a connection between the there's the there's the uh, the ear and the the temporal lobe and then directly connected with the temporal lobe is uh, the hippocampus and of course auditory signals are basically a lot about connecting uh, a signal with a meaning and that is basically the the whole temporal lobe is about connecting two two things also a sense data with a meaning or a concept and you can basically uh, see the whole temporal lobe as a uh, mapping between what you, what you hear or, or between concepts and between concepts what you hear um, and language and there's even the the language center is fittingly in the in the uh, temporal lobe and it connects with the motor mo motor center the broadcast area somewhere here so there's a there's a direct direct connection uh, actually a separate uh, bundle bundle of nerves connecting connecting uh, temporal lobe with the with the motor lobe uh, to produce language and that is the that is the connection so Okay, so coming back to the hippocampus and I have to switch cameras. Okay. So next one. The cerebellum. Do you have the cerebellum? Ah, I, ah there's the cerebellum. The cerebellum. That is basically like a, a three three D card in the brain. Uh, it belongs somewhere here. Okay, I have to I have to I have to reassemble the thing. So basically, uh, somewhere uh, at the back of the brain, there's the cerebellum. That's basically an optimization of the uh, of movement programs, but in general, all actions that can be repeated. And it, it basically helps with uh, with walking, with uh, uh, driving a bicycle, and you don't consciously think about each part of the movement. So basically, it helps with learning repeatable movements. This uh, is also, of course, connected with speech. It helps with uh, 
language fluency, you have balance, uh, and even social behavior. So that is still in a lot of research is being done. Originally, people thought it's only related to movements, but it has more, um, more uses. And I wrote cerebellum in sharks because you can imagine uh, it's not just swimming towards the fish and eating it. You might have to outmaneuver the, the fish. And if the shark has a cerebellum and the fish just directly reacts to sense data, then the shark can uh, do certain strategies to move around, up, down, left, right, and bite at the right moment moment to have much better chances uh, in getting the prey. And again, it does it isn't implied that we are uh, directly related to sharks. Uh, it's just uh, uh, it is in in sharks. It was uh, that is around the time when, when the first sharks appeared um, uh, when the cerebellum uh, evolved. Okay, and finally, neocortex. I already mentioned neocortex is, is the newest part of the brain and uh, it is about suppressing the rest of the brain. So uh, having a candy bar in front of you and not immediately eating it, it you can thank your neocortex. And you can train, or you, you can see that like with, with dogs, if you put a put a treat in front of them, they're really struggling because then it's they have a smaller neocortex than uh, than us, and they they might be struggling uh, between your command not to eat it and their their urge to eat it. Um, so and that in here the 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 neocortex come come into play, especially the the frontal part. And uh, where did the where did the neocortex come from? Um, I mean, it's need to have one, but um, it has to have a again a specific evolutionary reason. I mean, with the with the basal ganglia, we have seen okay, we have different signals. We have to we have to manage that. We have the, with the uh, optic tectum, we 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 track items with the amygdala. We learn and we have. Well, at least the basic basic forms of learning, emotional le learning, um, and we evaluate with the um, hypothalamus, uh, hippo hippocampus. We uh, connect two memories with each other. But what about the what about the neocortex? And one um, idea is is the nocturnal bottleneck hypothesis. Hypothesis. Um, you can imagine like uh, yeah, 70 million years ago, uh, the planet was dominated by dinosaurs. And the only uh, ecological niche the mammals had was to be active at night. This is also because uh, uh, dinosaurs were or are uh, cold blooded. So they had problems to be active at night. So they basically dominated uh, the day and all the other animals had to move, uh, had, had to be active uh, during night. And then, of course, you have uh, fur to, to regulate uh, body temperature. And you also had um, an expansion of the neocortex, especially the uh, olfactory system. Um, because uh, the olfactory system is special. I mean, we had it with the with the lancelets that they just move towards the uh, towards the nutrient source. But uh, with more complex animals, it gets a little bit more complex because you're not like picking up individual molecules of, of nutrients in your environment. You're either running away of uh, from from predators, and you have to uh, sense them or smell them and, and go away from that smell or you are yourself a predator and you're looking for for prey. The challenge is, of course, uh, the the temporal aspect of it. Um, if you smell something, you don't know exactly was was is it right here at the moment, the, the, for example, the prey, or was the prey like there five hours ago? And you can't like always jump into into predator mode whenever you smell smell a prey, you have to basically uh, suppress your 
you're, you're urged to now go into hunting mode. Instead, you have to find out by smelling the ground uh, where that uh, prey is, if it was there, if it was there five hours ago, and you have to track it. And that is basically the same as with uh, having a candy bar in front of you. I mean, the smell tells you, okay, there is something, but you have to use your neocortex uh, to suppress that, that immediate urge to eat it and maybe save it for later. Just like with the smell, you have to uh, suppress your immediate urge to, to think, okay, there's now a prey here. You have to suppress it and go into tracking mode instead of um, thinking that, is, that there's a prey right in front of you. And you also have to build like a model uh, because you have to, uh, for, for tracking, you have to find out, okay, in which direction did that, uh, did that animal go um, and, and find out the path, maybe, maybe calculate, okay, it was five hours there, so it is maybe one hour away now if you run fast. So there are a lot of calculations going on because the prey is not directly in front of you. And there's, there's a, basically a temporal di displacement and with the neocortex you can calculate, okay, where is the prey now? Where is it probably now? And the nocturnal bottleneck hypothesis is basically the idea that this selection pressure uh, of being have it, having to be active at night and not uh, ca you cannot rely solely on your, your eyes, you have to rely on your, your sense of smell. You need some sort of additional system to think about the future, think about the past, uh, and suppress immediate urges. So. Um, and that is already the, um, the end of this section. Namely, we, are, we have now arrived uh, like uh, 60 million years ago, uh, there was the, how's it called? Okay, I have to look that actually up. Uh, the event 60 million years. Uh, okay, I think it was 60 million years ago. Ah, fi okay, 55 million, yeah, wait, that is, do, 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 do. ah, okay, 66 million years ago, um, Gulf of Mexico, uh, you probably all know the, the story, um, it was 10 to 15 kilometers wide, um, uh, asteroid hitting, hitting the earth, and it basically killed all animals worldwide that were um, that weighed more than um, 30 kilos. So basically all the, all the large uh, dinosaurs all, all, all uh, died, uh, except uh, for, the, for the birds. I mean, because they were smaller and more, more agile, uh, they survived. And this, of course, opened the opportunity for smaller animals from the night to emerge again uh, for the day and that that is the story of our ancestors, the mammals. And um, bu, 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 bu. yeah, and especially the uh, primates, they they arose around uh, fifty five million years ago. And if we do, we have a picture. Oh, yeah. 55 million years ago and down to the last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees that is around five to seven million years ago um, and uh, the challenge I mean we, we have come now pretty far I mean we, we still we are still not really at least as far as we can tell not really conscious we have like this suppression thing going on with the with the neocortex uh, but it's we are still it's it's still unclear at what point can we say okay this this animal is now conscious if it if it has an amygdala and emotions or or isn't it or do we have do we need language or don't we need language so that is still an open question 
Now what we can look at is though the difference between uh, our closest, uh, closest cousins, the, the apes, and of course the humans. And um, I mean, uh, the, the story like six million years ago until now is relatively clear and we can probably say that most of the other humans in, in the past probably were conscious, um, but we will, that, that is again a detailed discussion we, we have to do uh, towards the end of the, of the course. Um, but especially interesting is what happened here until six million years ago, where we split with the, with the chimpanzees. So between 55 million years ago and six million years ago. Okay. And we already discussed that, that is the, what, what developed during these, these 50 million years is, uh, the, no. Especially the prefrontal cortex at the very front, because at the very front there are no sense organs, there's no visual cortex, there's no uh, no no, um, uh, no auditory cortex. The only thing is really the sense of smell, and basically the prefrontal cortex is very much connected to the to the sense of smell. Uh, this is also something you probably experience, like if you have. If, if you if you smell something that usually immediately reminds you of, of a memory you had with that. Uh, it's even that um, people in a coma, like with a damaged, damaged thalamus, again, this, this part here, um, thalamus, again, the thalamus integrates sense data, um, they can still make memories that are related to smell. So basically, people in a coma can still, consciously or not, that is the question, can still make, uh, can still smell, because um, the, uh, the the olfactory system, sense of smell, is connected with the prefrontal cortex. So that is that is something we will also use. So, so these these special uh, special properties of the brain we will also use to find out more about the brain. Okay. Okay, so I have to switch again here. Okay. And continuing. Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, again, the, the prefrontal cortex is uh, important, for example, for ob object permanence and all the models, except for the body schema, uh, is also located in the prefrontal cortex. So if the, if the prefrontal cortex is somehow damaged, then you might have problems with uh, uh, thinking about alternative scenarios and suppressing other parts of your brain. Um, prefrontal cortex damage can, for example, lead to what is called utilization behavior, uh, means uh, you have a very strong urge to use whatever is in front of you. Uh, to understand that, um the whatever you're looking at i mean even if you know it the brain calculates always basically subconsciously what can you do with the stuff you're looking at so the more cluttered your your desk is the more active is your uh if, is your brain to calculate okay what what can it do with, with all the stuff in front of you and of course the prefrontal cortex suppresses that urge to use whatever is in front of you. And with a damaged prefrontal cortex, you end up actually uh, starting using, using things. So you see, a, you see a pen, you have to disassemble it, or you have to write it, or you, if you see a, a snack, you have to eat it, or you, if you see a glass, you have to drink it, or push it down from the, from the, uh, from the desk. So you have to do things because you, you're lacking, if, if it's damaged, you're lacking the ability to suppress whatever signal comes in from the other parts of the brain. And of course, uh, social relationships, you might, you might not be able to suppress saying whatever comes to your mind because you're not, uh, you can't imagine, okay, uh, what happens if, if I say that? And without this uh, opposite suppressing signal, 
you you're doing it that is that is that is the way the the brain works basically with a lot of different competing parts uh, we will come to that in, in more detail but uh, with a lot of competing parts uh, and basically as i said the the basal ganglia selects the strongest signal so if there's no prefrontal cortex suppressing a signal then the strongest signal is executed and that might be the snack in front of you or pushing things from the table or drinking or whatever um, the good thing is this can also be like exercised and trained especially not, not just the prefrontal cortex itself but also the connection with the other parts of the brain and uh, if the connection is not not as good uh, it can also lead to for example you might have heard it of it uh, attention deficit disorder where um, it is similar to utilization behavior except that um, you're easily distracted which is similar i mean you you think about different things and the prefrontal cortex can't uh, focus uh, very well on, on one thing or uh, because it's not the prefrontal cortex but the connection with the rest of the brain or it focuses too much with, which is called a hyper focus so that is a little bit uh, interesting so if, if you know if you want to know more about it we, we can talk about it separately uh, interesting part of attention deficit disorder is that it's a mix between uh, hyper focus and uh, distractibility so people with attention de uh, deficit disorder can focus 20 hours or eight hours on something really it intensely uh, at the same time they might be distracted for the 20th time by a cat video on, on Facebook okay uh, now moving moving on uh, we need but i need a picture do you have a picture i need to ah and we need to talk a little bit about the brain parts um here i need this guy again here you have uh colors i actually i don't need this. Let me go back. And so you need this guy again, and you see the colors. And uh, each each color is related to a part of the brain. Basically, it's not one hundred percent, but basically, I mean, it's it's focused here on the way the uh, the skull is merged but it kind of relates to parts of the brain and on the side you have the um, the temporal lobe uh, with the connection to the ears on each side temporal lobe and that is connected to the uh, hippocampus then uh, at the front you have the frontal lobe uh, that is uh, on the one side the um, prefrontal cortex we just talked about about focus and models and there's also the, uh, for, for the back here, is also the motor cortex. So actions. And at the back we have the so-called uh, occipital lobe. That's the, the, here's the visual cortex. So basically the information from the eyes go all the, ba all the way back to the, uh, to the visual cortex. And then the information uh, that, that has arrived here is then uh, processed along different different pathways uh, and to the towards the temporal lobe as well as here to the large green one that's the parietal lobe and the parietal lobe is all about uh, signal analysis uh, uh, that means signal analysis from the from the ears although that is partly done in the in the temporal lobe signal analysis of course uh, the whole visual visual signal analysis uh, identifying things um, and finding out where they are in the in the three-dimensional room as well as signals uh, of uh, touch of your whole body of uh, how you feel feel inside that is especially uh, the, the, the sense of touch here, uh, especially at the top, directly connected or directly adjacent to the um, 
uh, motor cortex. So you can imagine that how important it is to have the sense of sense of touch connected with your uh, if, if if your motor action. So you have direct feedback. So if you touch something, you know you, you need the information how how, how, how strong you touch it, uh, how, how, how strong your grip is, and if you're still still connected to it, and also the the information of your uh, of your of your skin if you if you move your arm uh, that is all connected be to, uh, to the to the motor actions and also the feeling of your uh, of your joints um, and calculating um, calculating movements so that is that's it. That those are the most important parts so again temporal lobe frontal lobe oops, temporal lobe frontal lobe prefrontal cortex parietal lobe occipital lobe with the visual uh, visual cortex and here it's the somatosensory cortex here at the top uh, connecting to the uh, primary motor cortex directly adjacent uh, to do all the all the movements so and as you, as you see here that's right in the middle and right in the middle it goes then directly uh, to the spine so the information comes in from the spine and the information about movement goes out so uh, all in all well well designed good job uh, it is uh, it is an interesting piece of well of of a brain um Coming back to the motor cortex. So again, uh, motor cortex. Also at the at the front, front in the frontal lobe, and connected to brainstem and spinal cord, and then connected, of course, to our muscles. And the interesting thing is in primates, um, the uh, it can uh, bypass the spine's interneurons, meaning we have a much better conscious access to to our muscles. So it's uh, a lot uh, a lot more, more more direct control of of our muscles. Okay, and that is also. So and and the interesting thing is okay. What is what is the difference now between um, between uh, apes and humans in that regard? Um, apes are actually stronger than than humans, and that is because actually because they have fewer neurons in the primary motor cortex. If we if we remember back when we talked about the um if the hydra hydra had basically one signal and one one action so if, if there are some something is touching the the uh, tentacle then it uh, contracted the tentacles uh, to eat whatever whatever is whatever it touched um, and theoretically if we had like a single neuron in our primary cortex uh, exercise would be extremely simple because we would just think about something and we could immediately contract all our muscles and the fewer uh, neurons we actually had in our primary cortex the easier workout would be because at least in terms of mental work we would only need to activate a few neurons and we could activate our muscles so the question is uh, why do we why do we have more um, neurons in our primary cort primary motor cortex compared to apes? Apes are stronger because of it, uh, but with more neurons in our primary motor cortex, we have a fine grained control. For example, uh, we can uh, walk with a lot less uh, need uh, energy usage. So we are less we are less strained because we can do a lot a lot more fine grained control of our legs of our of our hands of course, and we use much less energy than walking, uh, because apes can walk 
uh, I mean, they are not built directly for it, but they can walk, but they use much more energy when walking. And that is partly because they are stronger. So um, that is that is an interesting connection. Um, so uh, also uh, uh, faster, they have a faster reaction time. Um, we have a slower reaction time, but we have but much better energy saving. And that is actually one of the keys uh, how our ancestors probably survived on the, on the uh, savanna because they could uh, walk much farther. Uh, and animals actually can't walk that far. Uh, even even antelopes, they sure they can run a lot, and they they can walk. But actually, we can outwalk them until they uh, actually collapse of of heat because they're using too much energy. And our body, because we're using more more neurons, can actually uh, use less energy than for our muscles and of course a better fine-grained control for uh, using tools and that is of course a big thing so actually it's not not much not not necessarily the difference of okay we're we're, we're so smart um, compared to apes but one of the biggest differences is actually in the primary motor cortex that we have more neurons allowing more fine-grained control and energy saving I've been walking. Yeah. Uh, we will later have one or two things where we also uh, differentiate between between uh, apes. Uh, I think a list will be coming up, and then we also can conclude this this part. So what happened uh, after those? Six million years ago, where we split up with the with our with our common ancestors with the chimpanzees. Um, here on the right side is the uh, size of the brain in cubic centimeters, uh, and as you can see, it uh, grew over time. It even grew if you look at the Homo neander as a, on, on the Neanderthal um, to a much larger brain than we have today. And it's not like that we, um, and that there were necessarily smarter. At least that is that is the assumption. So the question is, uh, why why did the Neanderthals have such a large brain? I mean, the first uh, the first thing you already found out. Okay, you have a larger brain than. Uh, than uh, other primates, especially in our primary motor cortex. So maybe we have a certain part of our brain that is larger, or the, the Neanderthals had a certain brain part that was larger. And one way, okay, I have to do full screen. One way to look at different species is by looking at their encephalization quotient, quotient uh, the EQ, and it is a measure of relative brain size uh, compared to how large or small the species brain is, uh, body, body size is. Uh, because uh, a larger body size also means more signals, because we all always have to remember um, Always have to remember, of course, all that skin, no, all that skin and all the muscles, all, all the, all the um, sensory parts here, all require processing in the brain. So the larger our body is, the more processing we actually need our, in our brain, and we need to use uh, more neurons for our to activate our muscles. So that is also part. So it's not just that everything uh, in our brain is related to, to abstract thinking. But a lot is simply uh, processing of uh, information. For example, the whale has up to uh, 9,000 cubic centimeters, so uh, five times, uh, six times our brain size. But they are simply that large. They, they need that large of a brain to simply um, process all the information of their body. And they're 
and that is visible in their EQ. So they are smarter, probably smarter than, well, but than an elephant, uh, maybe like a like a uh, gym, um, but uh, not not like five times smarter than we are. So it's not just brain size means means intelligence. Um, and we also see okay compared to our uh, to our body size, the Neanderthal also then ended up with a lower EQ than, than we are. Still, the list is a little bit bit strange if you look at the gorilla and compare it like with the chimpanzee. It seems like the gorilla is much uh, it isn't isn't very intelligent. Um, so something else must must be going on. So that might not be the, the full story. Because it's of course not just we don't have like different size or different sizes of scaled up or scaled down human brains. Uh, the brains also are different in terms of sizes of different brain parts. And if you look closely, for example, in the Enderthals, they had significantly larger eyes and a larger visual cortex. And of course, with a larger uh, visual cortex and maybe more processing in the parietal lobe, there is less space for uh, for like abstract thinking in the uh, in the frontal lobe. Uh, so that that has to be uh, accounted as well to uh, remove basically the the part of the signal processing uh, of the body of of uh, of senses of eyes. Uh, and uh, also include that in the calculation. Uh, and, and same goes uh, uh, with uh, gorillas, although I'm missing here one, one part. I think they probably also because of the, the body size or so. Okay. Question is now to so we are nearly done so three three uh, more slides and then we also in time done. Um, question is how did the brain grow? And uh, as you see, uh, it has like a folded structure and it uses uh, fractals. Uses uh, cortical folding and similar to fractals, um, it uh, just folds inside and folds again, folds again. Um, this you need to look at it. I mean, either you you know what fractals are, or it's something you should should look look into. It. Um, it's simply a way of uh, packaging something uh, while still uh, having a limited distance between the parts of the brain. I mean, here in the in, in the image, you see each leaf has about has a maximum distance to another leaf, like from um, from uh, oops, here 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 to here, oops. and that's it's a limited distance, and that is something fractals allow. Okay. Um, so, and as a sum, summary, yeah. Um, the question is, of course, why, why was there a split between humans and, and apes? And the theory is that uh, it's not just a linear development. Okay, let's, let's, nature did not say, okay, let's develop a human brain and, and go for it. Uh, instead, there were very probably significant environmental changes that forced our ancestors to adapt. And some maybe went out to the savanna. Also, that theory is also a little bit uh, in in question. It was probably more a diverse life, more an open life between uh, lakes and and, and and the savanna, while the other apes or the other of our ancestors remained in the uh, uh, in the in the forest or in the jungle. And as we've seen with the adaption of the primary motor cortex, I mean, that is the most signif significant change besides the prefrontal cortex. Um, a lot was about uh, energy uh, conservation and walking 
uh, walking far basically i mean you could also see you could also think that uh, th think as humans as simply those apes that walked a lot uh, because those apes that didn't walk a lot didn't reach Europe, basically, or or, or other parts of Africa. At least not in that in in that uh, speed. And if we um, to to summarize how what other adaptions we had to the savanna is uh, fire and cooking um, that uh, allowed a lot of time for digestion digestion uh, to be reduced. Our body is also partially adapted to it already. Then bipedalism, muscle control, as we talked about endurance. We also have a, a different cardiovascular system than apes, more focused on, uh, on endurance. Then also uh, sight and ranged weapons. Humans are the only uh, animal that can throw things accurately at a distance. I mean, there are like archer fishes that uh, that uh, uh, spit water at, uh, at at insects or something like that. Or apes can throw things, but not accurately. Uh, and a chameleon can throw its tongue, but uh, nothing in nature compares basically with humans and their ability to throw things at a distance. Uh, then, of course, language with the connection between uh, the temporal lobe and the, the frontal lobe. Reaction time and memory, the experiments point to that apes are actually better at uh, reaction times and memory, uh, although that is, is, a, is a little bit disputed, uh, but it could, could be something that could be imagined like that if you're living in the dense forest, you need to react quickly because the scenery uh, uh, changes more quickly while if you're in the open savanna you can just just look around and things change rather slowly uh, then use of games to learn in a non uh, dangerous environment complex tool use and weapon evolution of course uh, spear and, and bow self-domestication like we uh, build tribes and we basically punish those uh, that uh, just violate those tribes so over time we police basically each other and we become kind of self-domesticated so um, if you if you compare the facial structure of humans with those of domesticated animals there's actually um, um, a parallel to be seen uh, it's, it's also uh, even similar genes that uh, are responsible for uh, facial structure and the aggressivity. And of course, protected childhood, although we see that also in, in apes, but it is especially long in, uh, in humans. Okay, so what, what did we learn today? A lot about uh, different parts of the brain and uh, difference between apes and humans we can we will expand on that next time and next time we will start basically with the difference between humans and uh, and apes and primates and we will then go deep into uh, signal processing and really go into the um, uh, optical illusions explain uh, the modeling in the brain and uh, how, how basically how optical illusions function. Um, and looking at the overall plan, so we went through the first one history of evolution and basics of evolution today, evolution of attention and the rise of primates. And next time, um, the signal processing, and we will see how far we can get with the body schema. Uh, that's a whole chapter. There are also uh, special things like um, how phantom limb pain works. So if you, if you lose a limb, then you might still feel it. And why is that? And then conclude at least the first chapter here with the theory of mind. Um, just uh, organizational. If you 
I mean, all all that is already in the in the book. I've also linked it in the um, uh, in the in the video description and meetup description. Uh, so if you want to read ahead or read more in detail what I've told today, uh, you can uh, look that up. It's in print or as PDF and also for Kindle. And uh, about myself, you can follow me on uh, on the various platforms um, uh, and uh, on, on uh, Discord also for chat if you want to just chat with me. And uh, on YouTube, I will um, create a separate channel just for uh, neuroscience. Uh, I will also post, post the links, uh, but you should be able to, to find or, or follow me. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm very open to that. Uh, just just mail me or, or Twitter me or Facebook me or or in YouTube just leave a comment uh, so that I can improve. So uh, yeah, feedback from your side uh, here from Malik. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, it is uh, it is a challenging subject, and I recommend to go deeper with the with the book. Um, I will also post the um, parts of the book on my website, uh, step by step. I think the first two sections are online, but I will uh, try to post them each uh, uh, oops, e before each um, uh, before each meetup. Otherwise, uh, every two weeks I will try to continue this. I mean, I've planned it for this year uh, and just talk neuroscience. Um, any questions? And from Reptiloid. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you for listening. And that is it. Okay, then, yeah. Again, thank you for listening and I hope to see you in two weeks. Otherwise, I always try to uh, recapitulate what we did last time. So if you skip one, it's no problem. Just join join then the, the next one and you will still be on track to become a neuroscientist. <laughs> okay, then have a nice day. Bye.